Hello. Hey, Simon. <laughs> Hello. Hey, Simon. It's Skyler. Hey, Simon. Hello, Simon. Hello, Simon. Hello. What's up, Simon? Hello. Hello. How you doing? Hey. Hello. Hey, Hello. Simon. Hello, Simon. Hello, Simon. This is Conversations with Storytellers, a podcast of thoughts and folk and fairy tales, wisdom from our elders, and I am your host, Simon Brooks. A meeting with professional storytellers. I decided to travel around the country when I could to interview some of the elders in the community of traditional storytelling, people who, for their work, tell folk and fairy tales, myths and legends. Each storyteller shares their thoughts on our profession and gems of wisdom, and sometimes a story or two. I'm glad that you're here. I first heard Michael D. McCarty laugh. It was in a far-off room, so I followed the sound and listened to him impart joy and happiness upon all around him. There was, and is, some sort of magical aura he gives off, and it is quite wonderful. He wanted to be a physicist or an astronaut, became a Black Panther, an acupuncturist and a storyteller. There are very few people even remotely like Michael, and we only touched on a small part of what he's done. Please enjoy Michael D. McCarty. So Michael, I'm so glad that you're here to share your your voice and opinions and thoughts and, and expertise on conversations with storytellers. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm tickled beyond silliness to be on it. Happy to run my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Michael, you you've done your 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 history. Your personal history is incredibly varied, and in some ways, it, it, it there's a little mirroring with uh, Malcolm X a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I found was fascinating when I was uh, learning about you. Um, but how 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 was it like growing up as as wee Michael as, as a youngster? Because your dad was from Mississippi, right? Yeah, my my father was from Mississippi. My mother was from Barbados. Um, I I was born on the south side of Chicago. When I was about three years old, we moved to the West Side. My my parents bought a house there, and that's where I grew up on the West Side of Chicago. Now is that the good side of Chicago? <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. I wasn't sure. So I, I don't know Chicago at all. So I just wanted to... Yeah, yeah. West Side dad... Chicago, it, it put it like this. If people I talk to who are from Chicago, and if I mention my street and they know it, if they don't, they don't. If they, they had nothing to do with um, the West Side of Chicago, as most uh-huh. people who don't live there don't, they don't know nothing about it and they don't want to. <laughs> but it was a great, and my, I grew up in the fifties and the sixties, and it was it was a wonderful time. I mean, I grew up, um, you know, we owned our home. Folks up and down the block owned their home. Those kids, I grew up. I went to uh, Saint Fenbar Elementary School. I played with these kids from all the other schools in the area, and we had a great time. And most of those folks are still my friends. Oh, that's cool. So yeah. it, was, it sounds like it was a very community-driven um, Oh, yeah. Era. Yeah, that's really cool, and in a good way. Oh, in a great way. In fact, I, I always have to tell this story. My longest-standing friends, the uh-huh. Hudsons, specifically Janice and Herb, we met in 1955. Janice and I were in our fifth year. Herb was in his fourth year. They had moved in next door. I walked out of the back porch. I looked. From, from the back porch down, they looked up at me. We've been like that ever since. We've been together oh, wow. ever since. That's so cool. I, I yeah. that's yeah. I I have one friend that's like that, and it's it's a it's a treasure to have somebody like that in your life. But and I've got a few dozen. That's that's even better. I've only got the one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it's amazing. It's joyful, and and one of the nice things about having all these friends, uh-huh. years later, we would get together and talk. And I would find out things about my family that I didn't know oh, because no they had heard something about it. They'd heard, they, they'd heard my parents talking or they knew someone who knew. My father had been in the Merchant Marines. I didn't okay. know that. My older brother didn't know that. Oh, but wow. one of my buddies in the neighborhood knew another man in the neighborhood and he had mentioned the name McCarty and that's an M-C-C-A-R-T-Y. Right. 
And he said, the, uh, there was a man standing nearby. He said, McCarty, Grover McCarty, that's my, that was my father. They had been in the Merchant Marines together. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> now, there was a big, get so was your, was your dad a physicist? Did I, do I get that right? Was that you? No, that, that I wanted to be a physicist. That's um, right. Okay. My, right. my mother, my mother had me reading. I mean, two, three years old, I'm reading. And she wow. always read me stories and told me stories. And she encouraged me. So wow. after reading a whole bunch of comic books, and many of the superheroes in comic books, they're scientists, they're engineers, or some right. such thing. So that got me interested in science. And then she got me some a collection of books, and there was a section on Einstein. And I, 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 I wanted to be a physicist. And That's an so astronaut. Cool. Right, yes. I did. Yes, an astronaut and a physicist. Now, that would have been a good job to have. Yeah. <laughs> so so I'm going to ask you. Yeah, right. <laughs> so what comic books did you read? I'm curious. Well, in the, in the early years, like, say, up until about 10 years old, uh -huh. I primarily read DC comics. Superman, okay. Batman, Green Lantern, Wonder Woman, Justice League, Justice Society, old school. Uh -huh. And then somewhere uh, later on, like in middle school, high school, I got into Marvel. Oh, you did? I got, yeah, I got into Marvel Comics. And the thing about Marvel Comics that was intriguing, in the DC Comics, there was good, there was bad, right. period. Yeah. And, and, and everybody got together. When the superheroes got together, it was like kumbaya and what have you. Yes. But in the, in the Marvel comics, there was all these gradations of good and bad. And yeah. you had the Hulk, who was sometimes good and sometimes bad. And right. uh, all the, the Fantastic Four, they were always fighting with each other. And the Avengers roster was always changing for one reason or another. And it had more a reflection of the reality of the nature of... of friendships and relationships yeah real life almost yes yes as, yes as close as comic books superhero comic books can be <laughs> my first term paper in high school i think in my sophomore year was about the distinction between dc and marvel comics oh no way that's really cool <laughs> you know what would be interesting would be to do that now and compare dc and marvel now because mm -hmm. i think they've there's been a lot of changes oh there's been a lot of changes especially with dc yeah um, cause I tell you something, man, in, in the, uh, Justice League at Aquaman, uh -huh. um, Jason Momoa took Aquaman and turned him more into the Submariner. He, he bought that Submariner quality. Right. The, the, the Submariner, he was always pissed about something, pissed at, 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 at <laughs> Earth Dwellers or what have you. He was already, always ready to kick butt. The Aquaman in the comics was, you know, as as Chris Rock used to say, he could talk to the fishes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's yeah. Aquaman, he was he's very very. He was he was he was good. He was fun um, for sure, for sure. Yeah. So, um, were there, how many stories? Were there many? Because there's a big gap between you and the next sibling in, up in age, right? 14, 20, 25 years difference between me and my siblings. Wow, that's a huge difference. Yeah. I mean, we've got five years between our two kids, and, you know, I think that's quite big, but 14 years, that's... Yeah. So so were you, were you very close with them, or were you... I, I was more... very close. I was very close with my siblings. Um, it, it, in some ways, it was... It was almost like being an only child in one manner because by the time I got to be up and around, they're all grown yeah. and all doing stuff. But we were always close. My brother Grover, who was the 14 year next to me, my sister Juanita was 20 years older, and my brother Edward, 25 years older, they looked out for me, they cared for me. Um, Grover would clown me and what have you. He he got he, he took advantage of the, yeah, I got a little brother, I'm gonna work this. <laughs> yeah, show yeah, me an older we were, brother that doesn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we we remained close until uh, my brother and sister passed away um in the last two years. Awesome. And uh, awesome. my oldest brother passed away a long time ago in the seventies. That's too yeah. bad. Yeah, That's yeah. 
but I had them, um, and I I still hold dear memories with them. I got to spend time, especially with my brother Grover. Mm -hmm. uh, we got to spend a lot of time together hanging out. Um, he has uh, one of his daughters and my daughter were a year apart in age, so they, you know, we would take them different places together and what have you. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it was. Do they, do they still hang out? Well, yeah, they do on the phone because my my daughter is in Chicago and that niece Anika, she's in Atlanta. Okay, that's not too far away, is it? No, no, they, and they talk, they talk, and then I have uh, cool. another niece, Benita. That was my oldest brother's daughter, and then um, um, Wilhelmina. That was my younger brother's oldest daughter. I got to keep them all in order. <laughs> I know, right? It's like a deck of cards almost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we, we as a family, we keep in touch. That's one of my, that's one of my jobs. That's good. That's really good. It's, I think family is really important. Indeed. Especially when they're spread out a lot. I mean, I, yep, so yep. I, I talk about, you know, my family being spread out because half of them are in the UK. Well, actually, the majority of them are in the UK. Mm -hmm. I've, got a I've got a few cousins over here and that's about it but um yeah so yeah for me family is really important so who, who were the storytellers in your family growing up or, or if there my were mother. any your mother primarily my mother primarily right. my mother because i like i said i can remember two three years old my mother reading me stories and telling me stories and i'm a readaholic because of her my that's mother crazy. inadvertently turned me on to marvel comics Oh, really? All right. Because remember, I told you I started off with yeah, DC. DC, yeah. And uh, usually, once a month, my mother would go downtown Chicago to, to go to this shop called Hillman's. And when I went with her, there was this place on the corner that sold comic books. This particular Saturday, I wasn't going. She asked me what I wanted. I said, some comic books. Because, of course, I'm thinking like Superman, Batman, all of that. She right. comes back with some Spider Man and some. Fantastic Four and Thor, and I'm like, oh, this is, I just, uh, oh. oh no, <laughs> never mind. And it changed my world. <laughs> that's that's cool. So, what kind of stories did she tell you, and what stories did she read to you? Well, she she read me all kinds of folk tales, folk tales from all over the world. But mm -hmm. the thing that really got me, like I said, my mother was from Barbados, so she told me stories about growing up in Barbados and things. But the story oh. that I remember most, my mother loved to read so much. She would be reading late into the night and her mother would come in and, and tell her to stop reading and go to bed and turn off the light. And as soon as she, her mother left the room, she would go to the window uh -huh. and she would read by the gas street light. No way. Yes, yes, yes. She would read by the gas street light until she fell asleep. Wow, and well, we had didn't fall books. out the window. Oh, my God. oh yes, yes. <laughs> so, and we had books. We had books. I always remember there were shelves and shelves of books. We got um, magazines, Life Magazine, Ebony, Jet, Negro Digest, Sapia. All we had magazines. We got four newspapers: the Sun Times, the Tribune, the Daily News, and the Chicago Defender. How did anyone in your house get anything done with all that reading? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a lot of reading. Yeah, and we did. We read and read because my mother was always reading. She wasn't cooking or doing something. She was reading. And it just it just caught on with me. That's so so I, read, cool. I read the newspapers. Of course, you know, at first I started on reading the comics and reading the sports. But then I'd read the newspapers. I'd read all these different magazines and things because there were pictures and there was always something interesting. So she uh, she was the one. She was the, and my everybody, my my uh, uh, my brothers, my sister, everybody read. Right, that's so cool. That is that's excellent. So yeah. when did you? So your life, you've. I don't know how much of this you want to share. <laughs> I know that you're an open book. We said that already before we started. But um, when you when you left school, what were you doing then? How how was that path to astrophysicists and astronautists? Well, here's here's going? what happened. So I'm in. Uh, I went to uh, I, my my parents sent me to Catholic schools, private schools. So I went to Saint Finbar Elementary School from first grade through eighth grade, and then I went to Saint Ignatius College Prep for high school. 
And that was one of those prestigious kind of places you had to pass tests to get in and all of that. And mm -hmm. I went to that school like, because I said I wanted to be a, a physicist. I wanted to be an astronaut. And that was the kind of school where you graduated from there, you could go to any college that you wanted to. Mm -hmm. But what happened was that in 1966, my sophomore year of high school, now I knew about the civil rights movement, all right? Um, right. And I remember at the, be the beginnings of the Black Power movement. But the thing that happened in 1966 was that uh, me and a buddy on a Saturday night, we went to go to a party mm -hmm. and we got jumped on by a gang and they beat the snot out of us. And they separated us at one point. The guys who were kicking my butt wanted some fresh air. So they kicked me out into the street. And um, so this was actually in a building. Oh uh, yeah. It was started out in a building and then they beat me out into the street. It was one of the projects, one of those, those high rise projects on, uh, and nobody, on tried to, Chicago. and nobody tried to stop it. Or was oh, the gang, the gang was just too big and too big. No, no, you, you, <laughs> No, people didn't do that generally. Okay. Unless you were you were a tough dude and you were armed to the teeth. Okay. So what happened was that uh, at one point, like my friend was still inside the building. Uh, I I got in pistol whip. Guy tried to shoot me in the head, but the girl knocked the gun away at the last minute, and he pistol whipped me some more. And I crawled to another street, and I saw a police car, and I staggered over to the police car because my friend is still in the building. I don't know what's right, happened right, to right. him. And I'm frantically trying to tell him what happened and, you know, call all cars, do all that stuff that you see in the movie. And yeah. he looked at me and said, so what? And I got into the police car. I told him where to go. He pulls up in front of the building and he tells me to get out and go into the building to find my friend. Meanwhile, the remnants of the gang, they see me in the police car. They're coming to the police car to extract me and finish what they started. And I said, look, arrest me, take me to the police station. The police station was just a block or two away. And I thought, okay, this is an aberration. So I go into the police station. I never got a chance to say a word. As Soon as I walked into the police station, the cops there, all white cops, they just started laughing. Because at this point, I'm, I'm bleeding. I'm, I'm, I look miserable. I'm swelling up all around my head and shoulders and what have you. And my friend had gotten away into somebody's apartment. Um, we met at the police station and... Um, you know, went to the hospital and what have you. But that was my wake up call. That was my personal experience of police apathy. You know, because again, they supposed that, to help. Yeah, that guy and is beyond apathy. That's crazy. And I'm assuming yeah. that the, the officer in the car, and I, I use the word officer lightly, um, he was also white, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 All, the, all the officers I encountered were white. Wow. And That's so that was horrible. my personal wake up call. And I joined the uh, youth wing of the NAACP. Uh, black student organizations were starting in both high schools and colleges. Mm -hmm. And then in Chicago, we had a loose confederation of students from different schools, private, uh, uh, public. Mm -hmm. And we have demonstrations and marches and, and protests of varying sorts. And um, eventually, uh, in 1968, the Black Panther Party came to Chicago, and I joined that. That's it. Yeah. So the black, so what a, a lot of people I think don't realize. I, I, I'm assuming this, um, and it's only because I, you know, I'm interested in this kind of stuff. That the Black Panthers were actually a very good social organization, and that they did a lot of good work for people. Oh yeah, a uh, lot. Okay, let's see. There were the free breakfast for children program. Because remember, at when the free breakfast programs were started around 1968, 69, there weren't free lunches and and and, and meals at schools. All right? right. Then we started the free medical clinics again because there wasn't. I mean, you could go to the county hospital and wait for you know forever. Um, and then we started sickle cell anemia testing. And at that time, nobody paid any attention to sickle cell anemia because it primarily affected blacks. Wow. And so we started uh, uh, testing for sickle cell anemia. And then the other thing, and this was the thing that really wrecked havoc on, on the powers that be, the Rainbow Coalition started by the Black Panther Party in uh, 1969. It was the, the, Illinois, the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party 
the Young Lords, which had been a, a, at one point a street gang which became political, and the Young Patriots, poor Appalachian whites, a.k.a. hillbillies. Okay. In fact, on um, American Revolution II, which you can find on YouTube, there is a, 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 a video of that first meeting where Bob Lee, our uh, field uh, secretary, uh, under Fred Hampton's direction, had gone into that community to organize, and because uh, you see it in that that uh, that that film, he mm -hmm. said, "Okay, you all are getting hassled by the police. So are so are we. Your food and your stores are substandard. So is ours. And when we just have all these things and poor housing, poor uh, options in terms of groceries and what have you." And he spoke of how we should work together. And at the end of it, now I'm going to paraphrase this because I'm a storyteller. I take all the license I want. <laughs> at the end of it, the interviewer, who's also named, whose name was also Michael, he asked this young patriot elder what he thought about the Panthers talking about working together. And I actually, I'll paraphrase. If them Black Panthers are going to support us, we should support them Black Panthers. Now, here's the thing that's not in that documentary. About a week later, Bob Lee was up in Uptown. It was, this is all in, taking place in the Uptown area. He mm -hmm. was up there organizing. Usually, uh, uh, Hank was with him as a bodyguard, but this particular day, he was by himself. The cops saw him alone. They swooped down and arrested him and were about to take him off to do no, who knows what. Some of those young patriots saw what was going down. They put the word out. Those young patriots, those poor Appalachian whites, they came, they surrounded that police car and forced that officer to let Bob Lee go. That's incredible. Poor Appalachian whites, blacks working yeah. together. And over right, time, because, go ahead. It, it, it is a class thing. I mean, it, oh, yes. It, it, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, it and race is, is used to divide people. Right, exactly. Yeah, it, it, yeah, I totally agree with you there. It's uh, it's it's horrific what what society has done to the population, and it hasn't. I don't. I mean, there are certain advance, advances that have been made, but I don't think that much. You know, the deep stuff, the real stuff that needs to be We're done. Still dealing with it. right. You're still dealing We're with still it. Still dealing and, with it. Right. Same and, song, different day. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like they. Uh, it's like they, they scratched the surface of it. They gave it a little uh -huh. buff up and they made it look pretty. And, and then they were like, all right, that's it. We're, we're good now. I mean, that's how yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm totally wrong. No, you're totally that's, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, it's, it's, it's awful. It's awful. So my, the Black Panthers must have had a huge effect on you growing up because you oh, were yeah. what, you're in your late teens then, right? Yeah, I was, when I joined, I was about 18. Right. Um, I was going into my senior year of high school, and it did have a profound effect because it was in being involved in the Black Panther Party, party that I learned about commitment because people were committed. We were committed. We were committed. We, we dedicated our lives to this organization and to this movement. That's how important it was. Right. And it wasn't necessarily political, although there was a political overturn. Oh, yeah it, was, it, yeah, it was definitely political. It was it was political, social, because the truth of the matter is there is no separation among those things, especially when you're right. poor, when you're on the on, on the ass end of society. Those those distinctions are meaningless because yes, it didn't matter. Uh, OK, here's something that you may not you probably don't know because you're not from Chicago. There was a segment in America. Chicago <laughs> called Hill Hill. And it was in the black community on the south side in the South Shore area. But that was where all the doctors and nurses live in this particular area because and they Hill couldn't Hill. live other places. There was, um, um, you know, we had the sundown towns in, in uh, Chicago. Cicero, which was a part of Chicago <laughs> during the day. But at night, your butt better not be in Cicero when the sun went down. All right? Wow. Okay. Because you would be beaten, you could be killed. I remember one day me and a buddy of mine, and I'm I'm in I'm in elementary school and we rode our bikes. We didn't know any about this, anything about all this. We rode our bikes into Cicero 
and we stopped at a gas station to put air in our tires. Next thing you know, this guy's got a hose, and he's hosing us down and laughing about it. And his friends think this is a very entertaining thing to do. Um, there was this area on the south side of Chicago where Mayor Daley, uh, the, uh, the original Ra Mayor Daley, lived. Mm -hmm. And when I was in high school, somebody had the bright idea to take us over here, and we were going door-to-door to door trying to sell something. Now, this is an area where there was a Catholic church where the, 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 the priests uh, preached racism from the pulpit. And there was a sign on the church, something like, no niggas allowed. Wow. All right? This is the church. So we're going door to door. Like I said, this is, you know, Sinkating Nation was a primarily white school. So there's black and black. But me and my buddy Gary, we were knocking on doors and getting doors slammed in our faces. And then one of our white classmates, he pulls up, he had a car. He pulls up and says, come on, y'all, come on, get in, get in, get in. He had been walking in another part of the neighborhood and he had heard these white folks gathering together and they were coming after us, me and my friend. We were, the, we were two black guys that were part of this and they were coming after us to do us bodily harm. And you're elementary age? Uh, this was high school. This was high oh, school. Oh, sorry. Okay. Wow. Yeah, this was high school. Jeez, that's crazy. That's that was crazy. Chicago. Yeah. That, well, that is Chicago. It <laughs> is Chicago, right? Yeah. So how did you get into storytelling? Ah, well, part one, as I told you, I've always been exposed to stories through my mom. Mm -hmm. And talking story was something that I've always done because that's the way we communicated stuff. Right. So 1992, I'm, I'm here in Los Angeles and um, I, was work, I, 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 was, I was going through a lot of stuff I was having some financial difficulties. A friend of mine, one of my acupuncture colleagues had connected me up because I was, I had been trying to get my acupuncture license in LA and I was scuffling with that. Right. Can we, so I want to back up a little bit here. Cause I do know something a little bit about this. You learned acupuncture in the army, right? Cause you were in the army for a while. Yes. I, when I, I was in the army, uh, in station in Korea, I was on the, uh, division Taekwondo team. And mm -hmm. one day I had sprained my wrist. And I went, uh, I went to the bookstore because I was always in the bookstore. And the Korean gentleman who ran the bookstore, I, he did acupuncture because I walk in, he have a needle sticking out the side of his head or out his ear or out his neck or something. And he started telling me about acupuncture. So I sprained my wrist. It was swollen and hurt like hell. He said, let uh -huh. me give you an acupuncture treatment. So I said, okay. So I watched him take one needle, go to two points and do some stimulation. And the swelling went boop. And really? so, yeah. And so, uh, I'm not good with needles, so I've never had acupuncture done. It's always like giving me the heebie-jeebies, but it works yeah, well, that quickly. If somebody's doing it right, no problem. No problem. Okay. So uh, when I got out of the service, uh, I went. I was in the service from uh, 72 to 75. And a few year, couple of years after I got out, an acupuncture school opened in Chicago, and I was curious. I wanted to know how it worked. I really had no thought at the time of being an acupuncturist. I was just curious. This is the and, scientist oh, in you coming out, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. And see, I remember I volunteered to help with a demonstration. They were using these ear points and the needle to help people stop smoking and lose weight. And I remember looking at this chart. There, there's a couple of hundred points in the ear. I'm like, how the hell you find a little tiny point? <laughs> it ended up becoming my specialty. Really? Yeah, yeah, that, wow. that's what. In fact, that's what I ended up teaching at the school, is uh, auricular therapy. So that was. Um, but but see, here's the thing. This is wonderful, because it's through acupuncture that I became a storyteller. Okay. Because one of my classmates, um, 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 David Heller, he moved. He left the school in Chicago because he moved to the Bay Area, and he finished out there. We stayed in touch. Uh -huh. And years later, this is 1992. Um, he introduced me to this friend who had a had a company, Moonshine Trading Company, and he was coming to USC to set up a booth for the conference on alternatives in Jewish education. And he hired me to work the booth. So the first day, Monday, he 
introduces me to this guy. He says, Mike, you need to meet this guy. His name is Joe Benizzi. He's a professional huh? storyteller. I'm like, what? Wait a minute, what? You, you get paid to tell stories? How you do that? I've been telling stories my whole life. And we storytellers, when we find somebody crazy enough to want to do this, we will knock ourselves out. And Joel gave me all this information and what have you. And while we were talking, it came to me. I said, I'm going to do this. And my model was going to be half mouth, we'll run it, which is my website. <laughs> And I, really? Yeah. yeah, yeah have <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I'm gonna look this up. Have mouth will run it. Yeah, you may have to go because some people have been trying to steal it from me, but I I, I keep it. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, there it is. Mahdi McCarty. Have mouth will run it. That's awesome. Ta -da! <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So, <laughs> so, I, I, so folks so who are listening, if you want to know more about Michael, you know how to yeah, so, will run it. <laughs> so once I learned about this, I, uh -huh. I asked myself, what would I do as a profession if I if I didn't have to worry about money? If I was independently wealthy, I, wealthy. I said I tell stories. I said okay, that's what I'm going to do. So I was living in Echo Park area of Los Angeles at the time. So I went to the library and started collecting books about the art of storytelling, books, collections of folk tales. One day. Because I'm in and out the library every few days with an arm load, load of books because I read fast. And you're broke at this particular point, so you were not yeah. independently wealthy. Yeah. No, I wasn't not, I wasn't <laughs> independent of nothing except broke. So this uh this librarian, Anthony Bernier, he was the young adult librarian. He says to me, he's helping me find some books. He says, I, I see you in and out of here every few days with an arm load of books. Are you writing the paper? I said, No, I'm a storyteller. You're a storyteller. I've got these teenagers. They want to learn storytelling. Can you give them a workshop? I said, sure. <laughs> my mama told me that if I could read, I could do anything. I could read my butt off. So I gave the workshop. It was a great success. I became a resource for the library systems in the area. I ran into all these storytelling groups, local, national, international. I joined everything. <laughs> so so you did a workshop with before you were actually a professional storyteller <laughs> is that right am i hearing that yep. right <laughs> yep <laughs> how audacious of you i love I'm that crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh that is so cool so what what stories are you particularly drawn towards when you when you're looking for stories what, what's your your place well, of I comfort start, i guess i start up in high school Mm -hmm. When I when I got into the civil rights and black power movements, I looked for stories about black history and culture that weren't being taught because all the stuff that you saw in, in anything, you saw slavery, you saw Booker T. Washington, you saw uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah, Fred, Fred, Fred Douglas and, and, and that's I mean, just a few things. Right. Yeah. Well, there were all these things about Africa that nobody do anything about the the the, um, the history of Africa, the countries of Africa, and all the of the diaspora, all of these uh, in the Caribbean, all over the world, where people of African descent had settled and had major parts in the world, in Russia, um, um, in France, and all these different places. Now, now, see if my brain works. Um, I, I, okay, let's see how to figure this out. Yeah, I see that. I see that. Yeah. Um, now I just got to remember his name. He's the poet laureate of Russia, Pushkin. He was of African descent. His father, his father was a, a general and an engineer. And I mean, Alexander Pushkin, the father of Russian literature, yeah. of African descent. Who knew? I didn't. <laughs> oh, yeah. Who knew? Um, That's incredible. In in France, uh, the Dumas's, I right. mean, Alexander Dumas, Alexander Senior, Alexander Younger. One was a the older was a was a general in Napoleon's army. Right. Um, then there's the Three Musketeers, uh, uh, and, the Dumas, Iron Mask and, all, yeah. and then there's the younger brother who was a playwright. Uh, we went to uh, Paris a couple of years, and there are these wonderful displays 
uh, within, a, I think they're all on the same block or the block of each other of each of the Dumases. And there's so much more. I mean, there's so much more. There has to be. And people I mean, don't have a clue. That's amazing. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, when I came over to the States, you know, as one of the things I, that I have found is that, and, and I think a lot of this comes from colonialism, right? I mean, England, Britain, we, we invaded the whole wide world, right? Mm -hmm. and so our newspapers are filled with news from the whole wide world. It's just being, it's just what we do, right? Even though we've given most of the, most of the world back to itself. And, and so English newspapers have always had a lot of information about the world. And, and when I came to the States and started living here, you know, I realized that there was very little news about the rest of the world mm -hmm. yeah. going on. Because America is the center of the world, of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> right. But there's, there's all that misinformation, though, that comes from yes. that. And, yes. and, you know, when I first came out, when I visited here, um to stay with one of my cousins and actually I was tr i'd spent three months traveling around you know the, the whole aids thing it was you know it was like this big gay disease and it's like it's not it's yeah it's not at all yeah and, and it's like yes it is and it's like no and you go and you know because i came over when the aids epidemic was really big it was when tammy faye was bumping into people in the mall remember those t-shirts mm -hmm. that, that were just makeup and oliver north was being like questioned and yeah and, yeah 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 and uh it, it was just like you know this isn't this is misinformation so i buy an english newspaper when i could find one and i'd be like look this is this is this is what's really going on it's not a gay disease yeah and so you know i was edu you know my cousin who's much older than me and this was a, a i think she was a psychologist or a therapist and you know she she had no idea and she was an educated woman right and, mm -hmm. right and it's just it, it just baffled me and so a lot of the African history, or part of African history, not all of it, not a lot, but, but you know, I knew from when I was like a, long, a lot, lot younger, I, a lot more of the history of the world, not just Africa, but a lot of the world right. that Americans just didn't know. No. And it, and it just baffled me that, I mean, it's, this is a big country. I, I get that. And there's a lot of stuff going on, but you can learn so much from learning the history of other places. Yeah, and, and, and it I, gives that's you something I preach. Yeah, and it gives you a much better worldview as well. Yeah, yep. Yeah, because at that time, that that the AIDS epidemic was was uh, uh, cresting here. Mm -hmm. That was uh, in the beginning of my acupuncture years, and I trained at this clinic in New York, in the Bronx, a Lincoln Detox. It was an acupuncture detox program, and it detoxed people from heroin, methadone. Uh, eventually crack, but there was also a segment um, of treatments for folks with HIV and AIDS. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had a, there was a, a, a program, it was a clinic in Chicago, and it was a collection of acupuncturists, chiropractors, napropaths, massage therapists, uh, homeopaths, who they treated people with HIV and AIDS. But the thing about it was, was so rough, because people could only work there so long, because everybody died. Right. Everybody died. And if you're a healer, that's got to eat away. Everybody, you, oh no God. matter what you do, everybody died. It, it, it would be crushing after a while. So people could, could work so long and then they'd have to, have to take a break or they, they just didn't come back because it was just so uh, draining. Yeah. Wow. So you, you met Joe Ben Izzy. Mm hmm. And you were doing acupuncture. Well, I was and... I, I was trying to do I was trying to get my license out here at the okay. time that I met Joel. But then once I discovered acupuncture, I decided or I figured out that my job is to needle people with my words. <laughs> <laughs> no, heal people with your words. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, and and so the you you were doing a lot of historical stuff as well by the sound of it like oh yeah historical story storytelling what what one of the things i do as i i search for both history and folklore from the diaspora the african diaspora mm -hmm. so wherever there were people of color i found the stories i found collections of stories i found the history 
and um, the fights against slavery. Did you know that Haiti, um, um, Toussaint Louverture was one of the leaders of the Haitian Revolution that freed ha Haiti from France. But okay. Haiti had to pay reparations to yeah. France for freeing itself from slavery. And that went on for like a century. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, so it was one of the reasons that Haiti was so broke because they had to pay these reparations. Have, has Haiti tried to get that money back? I don't know. I don't know. I I, I, I hope so. But uh, that would help. Them a lot. That's going <laughs> to be a more than a notion. Yes. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I give away books in my uh, summer reading programs. So when I do a show at a library, I tell a story. I ask the kids questions. They answer correctly. They get a book. Wow. So what, so where'd you get all these books from? Um, I buy them here or there. Some people, I've been doing it so long, uh, bookstores, they give me a discount or they uh, give me books. Um, friends and, and, and uh, neighbors, they know what I do and they, they give me books. But That's I buy cool. a lot of them. I, I, buy, I buy a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> and how many books do you give away a year, do you think? Oh, God. Probably two, three thousand dollars worth of books, at least. I was going to say, at least it's got to be. That's a yeah. lot of books. That's a lot yeah. of money. Yeah. Good for you, man. That's excellent. Pay that's... it forward, you know. Yeah, that's true. Because I tell you, okay, I got to tell you something. It's so sad. So many, uh, so many kids don't read don't know how to read or don't have books. I remember I was, mm -hmm. I, I, I was giving workshops at the boys and girls clubs in Long Beach in the nineties. And in my workshop, you tell a story, you get a book. So one day this little girl came in and I was setting up and she said, what's going on? I told her about the workshop and that if she told a story, she would get a book. She said, Oh, can I come? And I said, yes. And she said, it's my birthday. I said, today is your birthday? She said, yes. I said, take a book. Yeah. And then she stayed in the class and she got another book. And then uh, she says to me one day, I, I got to keep from crying. The only books I have are the books that you've given me. Uh, if she was 10 years old. Yeah. All right. And uh, so I, I give kids books. I keep and okay. This is a story that one of one of my uh, um, one of my students in one of my prison classes loves. So I was at a, a whole coming out of Whole Foods in Pasadena, and there was a a, 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 a black teenager, a boy, and I said, uh, "What do you like to read?" He said, "I don't like to read." I said, "Oh, okay." I said, um, "You like Tupac?" He said, "Yeah, I like Tupac." You like Fifty Cent? He said, "Yeah, if I got Fifty Cent." I got books by Tupac and Fifty Cent. You want them? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I keep comic books in my in my car. Yeah. Uh, one time I was doing a program at a continuation high school. Continuation programs, kids have been kicked out of schools and what have you. And I'd done this program and I gave all the kids books. And then there were these boys I saw that didn't have any books. I said, uh, you want a book? Oh, I don't read, man. I don't read. I said, and I reached, I said, I got some Marvel comic books. Oh yeah, oh yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. So I, I I gave them the Marvel <laughs> comic books. And what I had left was a physics, a physics book and a workbook. And the class was over. Most of the all but one of the kids was in another section of the room. And there was this one kid sitting down, a Latino teenager, and I had the books and I looked at him. I saw him sort of looking at the books. And I said to no one in particular, anybody interested in reading about physics? And he looked at me, then he looked to see no one was looking. He said, did the head nod? <laughs> so I slipped in the books. <laughs> I'm sneaky like that. <laughs> That's excellent. There's an area of Southern California, Hemet, Hemet, California, near Riverside. And I'd done a program there a library program. And then five years later, I came back. 
And there was this woman in the audience with no kids. And so after my program, she comes up to me. She said, I just wanted to share something with you. I came to your program five years ago with my kids. She had a son and a daughter. And they each won books because, like I said, I ask a question, they answer correctly, they get a book. Mm-hmm. And she said to me, they still have those books. They oh. still cherish those books. And I just wanted you to know. Oh, my gosh. Oh, ah! that's getting me choked up just thinking about it. Oh, oh yeah. God. I think if, if, if that had happened to me, I think I'd just burst into tears. That would be. Oh, funny. it was so, it was, <laughs> I, I smiled so hard. It, it, oh, I mean, face hurt. <laughs> oh, I bet. That's amazing. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. Giving kids books is, is one of the best things ever. And when, when you get kids that don't want to read or they say they don't want to read, uh-huh. and you, you, you sneak a book on them, and you, you get talking to them, and they're like, all right, I'll give it a try. you know. And then you, you see them reading it. Yeah. You're like packing stuff up, and you can see them turning the pages, and it's like, this is you go open them up to a whole new world. Right, right. I mean, one well, of the things that I always say to kids that say that they don't like reading, I just say you don't like reading yet. It's just it's just finding that one book to open the door, and then once that's the door it. is open, it's that's it's incredible. That, and 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 oh, it, I, I remember there was this there was this kid in my uh, Long Beach um, Boys and Girls Club class, and when he was in my class, he when he started off, he was in elementary school. Uh-huh. Then some years later, I saw him. He was in high school. And he said, storyteller. I said, hey, man, what's going on? How you doing? I said, you still reading? He said, yeah. oh, yeah, all the time. I said, come on over. Because I had a book. I had a, 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 a box of books in the car. I said, take your pick. Have what you want. <laughs> That's excellent. That's so cool. Have you ever thought about writing a book yourself? I actually have written a book, but I the, the, uh, I got bogged down in the rewrite. Oh, and so the editing. At, at yeah. some point, I'll I'll get it done. Yeah, it sounds like it, it would be an ideal match. I mean, you know, just writing one of those picture book autobiographies. You know, would I, I be just quite have, incredible. Yeah, 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 yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Because you've done a lot of different things in your life. Woo! And I ain't even told you stuff. <laughs> I know, I know. If people you're are that interested, you got a show for me to tell you some of the stuff. <laughs> I know, I know. We're not gonna, we're not gonna get into that. So yeah. when you find, when you find a story, how do you go about learning it? What's your process? Well, so I'll go through. I'm looking around to see if I have one of the books handy, but I don't. So I'll go through a book, and I'll note. I have these little tabs that I put in the book: the stories of interest or potential telling stories. Mm-hmm. And then I'll go back over those stories and I'll, I'll tell them. I'll, um, it's not so much now. When I, when I first started storytelling here in L.A., there were a dozen storytelling groups in, in, uh, in the area, from San Diego to San Francisco to the desert to the mountains. There are all these storytelling groups. And I was just I was at everybody's group. Somebody want to, I'm up telling a story. So I, I had a lot of places to go to practice my stories. I don't have as many a, a, anymore. Um, but I still, I, I, how, what can I say? I'm great. <laughs> yeah. You are. I've heard you. I can verify that. For sure. <laughs> so, yeah. I, so I go through, I find stories, and then I sort of keep a roster of the stories I want to tell. So depending on the pro, for instance, some years ago, this is about 10, 10 years ago, mm-hmm. I was contacted by someone from the Cultural Affairs Department of Los Angeles. Now, East LA is a historic region. It's now primarily Latino and has been for, for some decades. But at one time it was black, at one time it was Jewish, at one time it was Japanese. So they were going to do a, a, a Japanese festival that and like I said it's it's all it's Latino now uh, primarily. Mm-hmm. They couldn't find a Japanese story, so person in the program had kind of worked out with me, and I talked about doing stories from other cultures and being sure you respected the culture. So mm-hmm. she contacted me. She said, uh, "We're having this Tanabata festival. It's a classic story. Can you tell the story?" I said, "Sure." 
I ain't never heard of the story, okay? <laughs> but I have a whole <laughs> collection of books uh, from all over the earth. So I found a couple of versions. I picked out, picked out a version, and I contacted her, and I said, okay, I have the story. Will there be someone there? I want to come early because I want to be sure of my pronunciations, and I wanted to hear yeah. it from somebody as just opposed to doing a little voice thing on the, on the computer. She said, oh, yeah, there'll be somebody there. So I got there. And I asked him about the first thing, which was Tanabata, the, the heroine of the story. And then I asked about this other name. He said, yeah, that's the correct pronunciation. But who was that in the story? And I told him who it was. He said, you, you know the story better than me. <laughs> you got to love it when that happens. Oh, it's yeah. True. It's true because, I mean, you know, uh, somebody grows up with a story. They know the version they grow up with, right? Yeah. And that's and that's pretty much it. But when it comes to people like yourself, we don't just hear one version. We try and get as many different variants as we can. Yes. Right? And, the, and we, we, we go deep and we look into it. And then we put all the best bits into the story, right? Well, the, best, mm -hmm. the things that we think make the story work as, as, as best as it can for us to tell it, right? And those other people that haven't done that, you know, haven't been steeped in story as much as you people like yourself have. It's like they don't have that. They don't know about those variants. Yeah. It's so cool when you're able to like share that and it's like, well, where did you get that from? And it's like, I go back to my notes. I was like, this is where I found it. That's really cool. Because the version I know, and then they share their version of the right. story the, right. from where they grew up. And then you've got like a first hand primary source version of the story. It's like, all right. So it's pretty much the same, but I can add this in now. And it gets, it's for me, I don't know about you, but for me, that's really exciting when you get these first hand primary source. Yep. I, I got one for you. So one oh, yeah. year I, I was doing a program at the Skirball Skir Cultural Center here in L.A. And yeah. it was a program of international folk tales. So I'm, um, it's an outdoor program. I'm getting ready to start. And I've got a variety of stories from a variety of countries in my head. And I see an Indian family come in, a father, his two adult daughters, and the daughter's children. So I said, oh, okay, I know what I'll close with. So I said, um, um, for my last story, I'm going to tell a story from India, Birbal's Search for Fools. And I see them, oh, da, 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 they get very, they're like, what, what, what? So I told the story. And afterwards, one of the daughters was the first to come to me. She said, my father used to tell us that story when we were children. Oh, no way. And then the father came up to me and said, very good story. <laughs> Which was like a standing ovation. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, it totally is. It totally yeah, is. Yeah, I love it when that happens. And it makes the audience more inclusive, as well. feel included. Yeah. Feel inclusive. When I was, there's a, there's a Haitian folk, folk tale that I do, and I was doing a festival in Chicago some years ago, and there was a Haitian family there. I said, "Oh, I'm gonna tell a a a a, a, a book. I'm gonna tell a bookie story." They were like, ah! a famous <laughs> character in in Haiti," and oh man, it's it's so wonderful to see folks light up like that. Yeah, yeah, I love that. So your process, you find these stories, mm -hmm. and then what? Do, and so you go to these these guilds and storytelling circles, mm -hmm. and what? And I practice them and tell them and tell them and tell them. So do you ever write them down or anything like that? No. Or are they just, in, you just read them until they're stuck in your head? Right. I, I read them and read them till I have a, a it's, it's a movie in my head of the story. But okay. here's the thing. I don't memorize. Right. I don't memorize. So there's a story I do called, um, oh man, this is, I'm having a brain fart. Um, but it's a story from South Africa. Uh, the Strange Creature, a story about the strange creature. Uh -huh. So when I first started telling the story, it was about a five-minute story. And over time, as I would tell it, sometimes stuff would just come out of my mouth. Yes. And I'm like, oh, that was great. I hope I remember it. <laughs> and it, it eventually became a 10 or 12-minute story. Oh, nice. Okay, but I, I got I to gotta tell you this while I'm thinking about it because I don't want to okay. miss this. So one yeah. time... I'm in, I think I was in maybe Encino, uh, California, and I'm doing a program. The first ast assembly was fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. So I told some stories. Everybody left except this one 10-year-old girl. 
And she comes to me, she comes up to me after and says, Mr. McCarty, I want to thank you for your stories. They made me laugh. I haven't laughed in a long time. Thank you. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, whoa, and she leaves. And I'm just blown away by this. The yeah. principal comes in and I tell her about this encounter. She said, oh, that little girl's father committed suicide a few months ago. Oh my God. But so for that little girl on that day, being able to laugh was the most important thing in her world. Yeah. I sometimes do workshops for teachers. And one of the things I stress is that you can tell stories with intent. You can tell stories for lessons and things like that. That's all well and good and purposeful, yes. But never discount just telling a funny story for the heck of it, a silly story or a funny story. Yeah. Sometimes that's just what's needed. No, I totally agree with you there. Absolutely. It is. It's really important. I mean, especially now, everything is just like so crazy in the world. Well, people, it's interesting. People need to laugh. Yeah, the, I, yeah, and I, I'll tell funny stories, but there are stories that I tell that are dead serious. I, and I remember the first time that I told a non-funny story. I was at this festival in Long Beach. And one of my friends came up to me afterwards. He said, Mike, man, at some point I figured out, I said, I don't think there's going to be no funny in this story. <laughs> 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 and it, and it was and if and for me it's a stark contrast for what people are used to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, it, you're you're known as the guy with the big laugh. Right. I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, that one <laughs> that can be heard through walls. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think the first the first time I saw you was at the National Storytelling Network conference, and. I heard your laugh, and I, I don't know how f I was a long way away from you. But when I heard that laugh, I was like, "Who is that? I want to, I want to talk to this person." And so I followed the laugh, and then I, I, I saw you, and I just, I just hung around on the periphery of everybody that was just like radiating underneath your glow of, of human <laughs> kindness and and uh, and laughter. It was absolutely brilliant. Thank and you. I think we, we had a, we had a short conversation as well, but you probably don't remember that. It was a long time ago. So I got a question for you. Sure. So I get the impression that you kind of, I mean, I don't know this for a fact, so I'm, I'm just guessing here, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. But I'm imagining that along with your historical stories, along with the folk tales that you tell, there's there are also some, there's some personal narrative that you oh, inject yeah. into some of these, right? What's important to you about folk and fairy tales? Why do you think folk and fairy tales should be told? Well, one, the imagination. Mm -hmm. They stimulate the imagination. Two, we grew up on those stories, those, those folks and fairy tale stories that we read, that we heard, and then they've all, you know, they've become such a part of the culture. They're referenced in movies and in TV shows and just about everything. Mm -hmm. So there's, and that takes us, I mean, when you think about it, that connects us with millennia of cultures yeah. and stories. So, and, and, and it's a window into another culture. Yes. And I remember one time I was doing a program and somebody came to, because I, it, it was, I was special, I was doing a program on, on, on the African diaspora. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, oh, you know, in my culture, there's a story like that story. And it brings to people together. It brings stories yeah. together. It brings people together. And through those stories, we see what we have in common as opposed right. to just what we're, how we're different. Right. It creates a community, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Gold star. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah. And, and what's important about the personal narrative when you tell personal narrative? What's important to you about that? Well, here's one of the things. For instance, my documentary, mm -hmm. um, I meet lots of people who you know, I've shown the documentary at, at, at some conferences. I show it at various places. And people say, Michael, I didn't know about this aspect of your life or that aspect of your life. And one of the things that people note is that, you know, I, I tell funny stories. I'm a mm -hmm. happy guy. Yeah. I've had 
tragic experiences. I've gone through hell in my life. And in spite of that hell, or even because of that hell, I have this, this happy view because I'm still here. I've survived these hardships, trials, and tribulations. The stuff that I went through with drugs, um, the, 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 the things that I had to deal with in fighting racism and, and, and things of that nature. And it gives people what not just insight into me, but I, I remember... Um, like I said, I was an acupuncturist who de- specialized in detoxing people from drugs. And then mm-hmm. I started telling stories about my own drug experience. And I remember I was in South Africa. I think I was in Johannesburg, South Africa. And I was speaking at a drug detox facility there. And these guys came up to me afterwards and they said, knowing that you went through what we're going through and you got through it, that means we can too. Yeah. Oh, my God. And I've had that happen in in Russia, in New York, in here in California, Chicago. When I share those, I I, I say I work in the prisons. I share all my stories in the prison. Um, um, And they so they uh, they 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 see that. I've been through stuff. I got through stuff. They can do it, too. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your work with prisons. Because that, oh, that's, that's, you know, I've, I haven't, you know, you do this on a regular basis. You go into prisons on a very regular basis from what I understand. And I've only gone in a few times. But mm-hmm. for me, it's been very rewarding. So I want to hear, hear about what your experiences of, of going into work. So you know, when I first came into storytelling in the 90s, there was this program in California, Arts and Corrections. And one of my storytelling friends was a part of it. But at that particular point in time, I'm just getting started. It wasn't anything I was ready for. Program got dis- discontinued, I think, in the 80s or the 90s. They resuscitated it in 2014. And that same friend, one that same friend and another friend from two different agencies contacted me and said, we're going into prison. You can give a storytelling workshop. Interested? <laughs> 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 so... Look, and I and I tell the guys this all the time. I said I knew that I had something that I could teach them that will help them, yeah. because in learning stories and learning about storytelling, when they go for the pro board, they got to be able to tell their story. Yeah, when they, they got to get out and go to a job interview or reconnecting with family and friends, they have to be able to tell their story. Yeah, and I'm I, I had one guy. He was going before the parole board. And I said, you ready for it? He said, oh, yeah. I saw him the next week. I said, how did it go? He said, I used 16 of the stories I developed in your workshop in my hearing. And at one point during the hearing, a panelist, there's usually three panelists. A panelist asked him a question. He said, I have a story that will answer that question. And all three panelists were like, okay. They just leaned forward. forward. Story trans, man, he had them. Yeah, that's so great. And he's doing great. He's doing great. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, learning to tell your story, I think it's really important because it's so empowering, right? I mean, I go into, into, you know, I'm sure this is the same for you when you go into prisons, but I'll go into classrooms in, in, you know, some, you know, pretty rough schools and I'll be working with these kids. And when we're doing workshops, sometimes this is the first time a kid has been actively listened to because they're not listened to by the teachers because they're the trouble kids. They're not listened to at home because the parents are like working eight jobs each and they never see the kid. Right. And, and to, to have a child that that could be anywhere from the age of like five to 15. Right. And Mm -hmm. they've never been listened to, you know, deeply listened to Yeah, and to have them get up and tell a story. So, I mean, I imagine if you've got, if you're working with prisoners, um, who are so much older and still haven't been listened to. They've been told and chided and put yeah. down. So that's got to be so empowering for them. It is. It absolutely is. And I cannot tell you how many guys I've, I've run into after they got out who told me, who thanked me for giving them that skill, that power, because I call it a power. Yeah. Yeah, that is a power. That's yeah. so neat. And when did you, when, so you started doing that in the 90s? Is that, no, 2014 is when you said you 2014, started. 2014, and I've been in a dozen prisons. 
Wow. Right now I'm doing, well, I'm doing three right now. One, one, one two. Yeah, three. I'm doing three. I have a Sunday prison I go to, a Monday prison I go to, and a Tuesday through Friday for two consecutive weeks that I do at another prison. And that's daily for two consecutive weeks. I mean, weekly. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Tuesday through Friday, two consecutive weeks. Yeah. Wow. It's out on the Arizona cool. border. So you travel because you where you're just outside of LA, right? Right. I, I sometimes drive twelve hundred miles a week. Ooh. That's a lot of miles. <laughs> Gee, I hope they pay you the mileage, right? Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. That's absolutely <laughs> crazy. I love that. So if if you were to meet a young person, you know, someone way younger than either of us, who is contemplating becoming a storyteller, is there any any advice that you would like to share with them? Oh yeah. Read like crazy. <laughs> Learn stories, read stories. Like um, I want, I, I encourage people, I said, wherever there are storytelling groups, local storytelling groups, the moth, storytelling, any kind of storytelling, go there, listen to stories. And when you get your opportunity, tell stories. Yeah. But, but in, in, immerse yourself in story. Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to chat with you. This has been remarkable and it's been a lot of fun as well as yay as well. i thank you for having me i love running my mouth <laughs> and i <laughs> love anything that gets people makes people happy makes them smile helps them to understand that they have a story and it's important yeah their stories are important everyone's stories are important it's true show up true. <laughs> thanks a lot mate take care all right comics, gangs, giving away books. We could have talked for far longer, but Michael had to run off and tell stories and no doubt give some more books away. I hope you enjoyed the time with Michael as much as I did. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, be sure to check out other episodes. And if you think I should interview a certain folk and fairy tale myths and legend storytellers, send me an email. You can find me and my work on Facebook, Simon Brooks Storyteller, and on my website, simonbrooksstoryteller.com. And on Instagram, Simon M. Brooks. Diamond Scree, yep, that's me, the English fella and storyteller. A shout out to Chris Jett for creating and recording and letting me use this wonderful piece of music he created, especially for my podcast. Thanks, Chris. His band is called Blackpool Mecca. Check them out. And they have a new album coming out very soon. You can keep this podcast alive and support my craft by becoming one of my Patreons and paying anything from a dollar for an episode that you enjoyed to a regular monthly subscription. In return, you get extras, early release, and exclusive content on my work. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Simon Brooks. If you can't join my wonderful tribe of patrons, then please help me out by doing something you can do. I'll be very grateful if you were to leave a review on Podbean, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find this episode. It doesn't take long. And it helps not just me, but others find and enjoy this podcast. Thanks again for being here with me. I know that there are a lot of other places you could be, and I appreciate it. Until next time, be healthy, be happy, and share the stories you love. Cheers. It's just a story.